Part 3, Section 3 of The Extermination of the American Bison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Hinman at VoicesOfTexas.com. The Extermination of the American Bison by William T. Hornaday. The Mounted Group and the National Museum. The result of the Smithsonian expedition for bison, which appeals most strongly to the general public, is the huge group of six choice specimens of both sexes and all ages, mounted with natural surroundings, and displayed in a superb mahogany case. The dimensions of the group are as follows. Length, 16 feet. Width, 12 feet. And height, 10 feet. The subjoined illustration is a very fair representation of the principal one of its four sides, and the following admirable description by Mr. Harry P. Godwin from the Washington Star of March 10th, 1888, is both graphic and accurate. A scene for Montana. Six of Mr. Hornaday's buffaloes form a picturesque group, a bit of the Wild West reproduced at the National Museum something novel in the way of taxidermy real buffalo grass real montana dirt and real buffaloes a little bit of montana a small square patch from the wildest part of the wild west has been transferred to the national museum it is so little that montana will never miss it but enough to enable one who has the faintest glimmer of imagination to see it all for himself the hummocky prairie the buffalo grass the sagebrush and the buffalo. It is as though a little group of buffalo that have come to drink at a pool had been suddenly struck motionless by some magic spell, each in a natural attitude, and then the section of prairie, pool, buffalo, and all had been carefully cut out and brought to the National Museum. All this is in a huge glass case, the largest ever made for the museum. This case and the space about it at the south end of the South Hall has been enclosed by high screens for many days while the taxidermist and his assistants have been at work the finishing touches were put on today and the screens will be removed monday exposing to view what is regarded as a triumph of the taxidermist art the group with its accessories has been prepared so as to tell in an attractive way to the general visitor to the museum the story of the buffalo but care has been taken at the same time to secure an accuracy of detail that will satisfy the critical scrutiny of the most technical naturalist the accessories the pool of water is a typical alkaline water hole such as are found on the great northern range of bison and are resorted to for water by wild animals in the fall when the small streams are dry the pool is in a depression in the dry bed of a coulee or small creek a little mound that rises beside the creek has been partially washed away by the water, leaving a crumbling bank which shows the strata of the earth, a very thin layer of vegetable soil, beneath a stratum of grayish earth, and a layer of gravel from which protrude a fossil bone or two. The whole bank shows the marks of erosion by water. Nearby the pool a small section of the bank has fallen. A buffalo trail passes by the pool in front. This is a narrow path well beaten down depressed and bare of grass such paths were made by herds of bison all over their pasture region as they traveled down water courses in single file searching for water in the grass some distance from the pool lie the bleaching skulls of two buffalo who have fallen victims to hunters who have cruelly lain in wait to get a shot at the animals as they come to drink such relics strewn all over the plain tell the story of the extermination of the american bison about the pool and the sloping mound grow the low buffalo grass, tufts of tall bunch grass and sagebrush, and a species of prickly pear. The pool is clear and tranquil. About its edges is a white deposit of alkali. These are the scenic accessories of the buffalo group, but they have an interest almost equal to that of the buffaloes themselves, for they form really and literally a genuine bit of the West the homesick montana cowboy far from his wild haunts here can gaze upon his native sod again for the sod the earth that forms the face of the bank 
the sagebrush, and all were brought from Montana, all except the pool. The pool is a glassy delusion, and very perfect in its way. One sees a plant growing beneath the water, and in the soft, oozy bottom near the edge are the deep prints made by the forefeet of a big buffalo bull. About the soft, moist earth around the pool, and in the buffalo trail are the foot tracks of the buffalo that have tramped around the pool, some of those nearest the edge having filled with water. The Six Buffaloes The group comprises six buffaloes. In front of the pool, as if just going to drink, is the huge buffalo bull, the giant of his race, the last one that was secured by the Smithsonian Party in 1888, and the one that is believed to be the largest specimen of which there is authentic record. Nearby is a cow, eight years old, a creature that would be considered of great dimensions in any other company than that of the big bull. Near the cow is a suckling calf, four months old. Upon the top of the mound is a spike bull, two and a half years old. Descending the mound away from the pool is a young cow three years old on one side, and on the other a male calf a year and a half old. All the members of the group are disposed in natural attitudes. The young cow is snuffing at a bunch of tall grass. The old bull and cow are turning their heads in the same direction, apparently, as if alarmed by something approaching. The others, having slaked their thirst, appear to be moving contentedly away. The four-month-old calf was captured alive and brought to this city. It lived for some days in the Smithsonian grounds, but pined for its prairie home and finally died. It is around the great bull that the romance and main interest of the group centers. It seemed as if Providence had ordained that this splendid animal, perfect in limb, noble in size, should be saved to serve as a monument to the greatness of his race that once roamed the prairies in myriads. Bullets found in his body showed that he had been chased and hunted before, but fate preserved him for the immortality of a museum exhibit. His vertical height at the shoulders is five feet eight inches. The thick hair adds enough to his height to make it a full six feet. The length of his head and body is nine feet two inches his girth eight feet four inches, and his weight is, or was, about 1,600 pounds. The Taxidermist Object Lessons This group, with its accessories, is, in point of size, about the biggest thing ever attempted by a taxidermist. It was mounted by Mr. Hornaday, assisted by Messrs. J. Palmer and A. H. Forney. It represents a new departure in mounting specimens for museums, Generally, such specimens have been mounted singly upon a flat surface. The American mammals collected by Mr. Hornaday will be mounted in a manner that will make each piece or group an object lesson, telling something of the history and the habits of the animal. The first group produced as one of the results of the Montana hunt comprised three coyotes. Two of them are struggling, and one might almost say snarling over a bone. They do not stand on a painted board, but on a little patch of soil. Two other groups, designed by Mr. Hornaday and executed by Mr. William Palmer, are about to be placed in the museum. One of these represents a family of prairie dogs. They are disposed about a prairie dog mound. One sits on its haunches eating, others are running about. Across the mouth of the burrow, just ready to disappear into it, is another one startled for the moment by the sudden appearance of the little burrowing owl that has alighted on one side of the burrow. The owl and the dog are good friends and live together in the same burrow, but there appears to be strained relations between the two for the moment. End of Part 3, Section 3 End of the Extermination of the American Bison by William T. Hornaday